Welcome to question 100 uh, of the Secunda Secunde. Uh, the topic is simony, and I am Dr. Thibault. Now, to place simony. Simony is part of uh, the section on the cardinal virtue of justice, the subpart uh, of religion, uh, which is a virtue in and of itself, which attempts to give proper uh, due to God. Uh, now, as a moral virtue, it has both excesses and deficiencies. The excess is superstition, and the deficiency is irreligion. It's something that's irreligious. Uh, now, there's irreligious by word and irreligious by deed. So, we are on irreligious by deed, which are sacrilege and simony. So, we are at the very end. This is the last topic on religion before we move forward to piety. Um, now, simony, uh, it takes the name from Simon the Magician, uh, if you recall from Acts of the Apostles. Uh, he offered the apostles money in order to uh, receive the Holy Spirit uh, confirmation. Um, and uh, Simon wished to buy the, uh, buy the gift of the Holy Spirit in order uh, that he might make money uh, by, uh, by being able to uh, cast out demons and to heal the sick and to do the things that the apostles were able to do. Uh, he wanted to be able to do that too, not because he wanted to be a follower of Christ, but because he was a magician and he wanted to be a more powerful magician. So it said, well, put your hands on people and they can do all the, have all these powers. Uh, put your hands on me and then I'll have all these powers uh, and I will pay you for it. Uh, this is simony, right? Uh, none of St. Thomas points out uh, from a line from Gregory the Seventh. Uh, none of the faithful is ignorant uh, that buying or selling altars, uh, tithes, or the Holy Spirit uh, is heresy. So quite obvious that this is not uh, acceptable behavior to be trying to buy the Holy Spirit, uh, buy uh, any types of um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, simony is heretical, uh, according to Article 1. Uh, it's an act, uh, an act uh, is evil uh, generically when it bears a, an undue matter. Now, Simony is undue matter in three ways. So uh, the first way in which simony is undue matter, uh, spiritual things do not have an earthly price. So when one tries to purchase uh, the Holy Spirit, um, that would be uh, a contradiction because how could you put a price on the Holy Spirit? It clearly uh, has to be a gift because nobody could possibly earn it, particularly with money. Um, uh, a thing cannot be due matter for uh, for sale if the vendor does not uh, own it, right? It would only the owner, which is true of all of the ministers uh, of the gospel, all of the followers of Christ, uh, right? The apostles, the bishops, the priests, you know, all the ministers of, uh, of the church, uh, they do not own the Holy Spirit. They do not own holiness. Um, the, they might be able to spread it, uh, but not as their own, but as one who uh, passes it out, right? uh, pass out something that's not your own, it's not yours, uh, right? That That's really the job of the, the priest. The priest isn't blessing from within himself, but as a conduit for the Holy Spirit to move through him, through God. Therefore, um, you can't sell it to a or a person doesn't belong to him. Uh, it is opposed to the source of spiritual things since uh, they flow from the gratuitous will of God. This is another important point. So, you know, it's free. <laughs> That's part of the irony. Uh, the, the grace is free. Therefore, um, the idea of buying something that's free is completely um, unnecessary quite much sense. Uh, now, you know, the, it's, well, it might be free, but I don't have the gift of 
have to, I don't have the gift of uh, uh, infecting the Eucharist or absolving sins. Well, that's true. I know you, you have to follow your own vocation, but uh, as an important spiritual practice, it's important to note that, you know, to be happy for St. Paul, for St. Paul's skills uh, of spreading the gospel, not good to be envious of St. Paul for the good that St. Paul does. Uh, you should be happy for St. Paul. that God has chosen St. Paul for that purpose. We should rejoice in it, right? We should rejoice that God has chosen Mother Teresa for that. God has, we should rejoice that God has uh, chosen Teresa of Lisieux to do her part, Joan of Arc. And, right? Each of the saints has been chosen for a particular purpose. We shouldn't be envious of them. We should rejoice. We should be happy for them uh, because God has chosen us for our own specific vocation. Um, so it doesn't make any sense to be envious of somebody else's vocation. So, you know, uh, you have the, the grace sufficient to do what the Lord has called you to do. Uh, you don't need to try to get somebody else's grace to do what they were called to do. Right? It might not seem as flashy or as glamorous, but that's not always what the Lord has called us to. The Lord has called us to be humble and to, to serve and to be excessive in faith, hope, and love, but not I can become greater than we are, uh, particularly because it tends to direct us towards wanting the acknowledgement of other people. Right? Somebody says, I want to be like Mother Teresa. Well, do you really want to be like Mother Teresa? Do you want the whole world to know of you the way that they know Mother Teresa? Uh, do you want people to think of you as a saint? Um, it's not entirely wrong, but you know the, the goal would be not the honor, right? The honor isn't the end in and in and of itself. Honor is only a recognition of what exists. Aim for being holy, right? aimed for being a saint. Don't worry about the honor part. Um, money for the sacraments. Now, this is a tough one uh, in reality, right? It's easy in theory. It's a tough one in reality because um, in the ideal sense, everybody would be pay paying tithes. Therefore, the church is fully funded. Uh, with the church being fully funded, then people don't have to pay for any type of sacrament. So they don't have to pay. You don't have to pass the basket at church. You don't have to do anything uh, like that because people are automatically tithing, that's the ideal. In reality, people are not <laughs> fully tithing. Uh, you know, a lot of people might not give at all. Um, however, uh, the clergy of the church still need to eat. They still need to survive. Uh, the church still needs to pay for uh, the material to offer the mass, even when it's not your wedding, even when it's not your baptism. You still need the materials for every other day of the year. So uh, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So uh, the priest cannot charge for spiritual grace, but it, uh, as St. Thomas points out, he, but he could charge for his livelihood, right? Uh, he could charge for what he needs to survive, his bodily survival, um, uh, you know, the maintenance of the church, things like that. Uh, it's not the price uh, of the goods, uh, but as a payment for the needs of the priest. So you're not buying the spirituality, you're not buying the grace, but you are paying for the needs of the, the priest and the church and the poor, right? Those are those three that go together. Why, why give it uh, an oblation? Why make a sacrifice for the good of the church, the good of the, pre the clergy, the good of the poor? All three go together. You know, if you say it's almost entirely up to people to get whatever they like, well, the poor will pay for it, right? <laughs> the clergy will pay for it. The church will fall down, right? Sometimes you have to be a little commanding with people. Um, uh, but the priest, uh, Tool Well, uh, says uh, they should look to the people for the supply of their needs, but to the Lord for the reward of their ministry. So this is an important part. Um, well, it's, it should be rule well, not true well. Yeah. Priests should rule well. Um, 
people should supply for the needs of the, the church and the clergy, but uh, the reward shouldn't be, well, the priest is so good, the priest is so wonderful, he should have a new Porsche, right? He should be rewarded for uh, his ministry. No, not, the reward is not earthly, <laughs> right? The reward for being a priest or a nun is not this, in this world. That comes from God in the next. But the priest and the nun still needs to eat. They still need heat. They still need uh, water. They still need a place to, to live. They need health care. There's certain things they need. So uh, that people should pay for. If the priest, uh, this is an interesting point, that if a priest will only baptize for money, uh, and he refuses to baptize somebody unless they get paid first, um, this would be a bit of a contradiction if they put their own payment above uh, the salvation of the soul. I guess this would be particularly in cases of poor areas um, and really corrupt clergy. I think that's the example he's pointing out. Um, St. Thomas says in that case, it's uh, possible for someone else to do the baptism. Any, any person could baptize as long as they use the proper form and matter. Um, so, and with right intention, uh, they can, they can baptize. Um, and St. Thomas points out that even if one cannot find somebody to baptize them and they don't have any money and it's, they're in danger of death, um, don't get baptized at all. And baptism by desire would be sufficient. Um, and that's a little bit of a controversial, uh, statement, but, uh, yeah, he says, you know, you the, the sins of the clergy shouldn't affect the salvation of the individual person. So, um, at the same time, you know, if somebody has a thousand dollar party afterwards that's fully catered and you have a $60 dismal outfit for the baby and you have a $150 cake, well, can you really not afford it? <laughs> um, Obviously, we're dealing with trying to balance two ideas. One is that you can't charge for grace. On the other side, um, you need to fund uh, the church. <laughs> and you want some. You want the church to be there to do these things. But at the same time, if you don't get funding, then how are you going to do that? And you're no longer funded by any type of state. So it, it, it requires people who are using the services of the church to pay for the services. Of complicated. Um, whether it's lawful to give or to receive uh, money. Um, this is very similar to the last one. So it is absolutely forbidden to make a charge for that, uh, for what is acquired uh, by the cons consolation of invisible grace. Therefore, by demanding a price or by seeking any kind of return, whatever. So to charge for grace uh, seem contradictory to what grace is, right? Grace is a gift from God. Therefore, a gift from God can't be monetized, um, very basically. Um, well, and, and then the, the, the other point back from Article 2, uh, response to Objection 4, it's very important that things don't even appear to be a charging for grace. You know, that's the... That's the other side of it is that, you know, to outward appearances, it may appear as simony, right? It, the church does need to fund itself. The church does need to make good. And at the same time, you know, if somebody doesn't come to church very often and now they do they get married and you go, okay, well, that'll be $500. It, the appearance might be that the church is only caring about money, right? Whereas uh, somebody who goes frequently to the church might be happy to give $500 to their church on their wedding day. Somebody who never goes to church might be scandalized by the $500. At the same time, the person who always goes probably contributes all the time. The person who never goes probably never contributes. So you know, it, it's a difficult balancing test. You can uh, easily see that there can be uh, some scandal in the idea of simony, you know, the idea of charging you know, there was a wedding officiant, it wasn't a, a priest, but uh, charged so much for a wedding and then 
wanted them to go to your wedding reception and to give a blessing over the meal, they wanted to charge you another $15 to do the blessing over the meal to be grace. It was kind of a, uh, an odd thing. You know, you're going to charge $15 to say grace <laughs> over, over a meal. It seems a little bit um, like simony. Uh, doesn't look good. It seems a little bit like avarice, a bit greedy. Um, and there are a number of, you know, this is more, less of an issue with the church and more an issue with, you know, weddingofficients.com, things like that, where, um, you know, the, you know that the money from these weddings and these, uh, sacraments are going to pay the heating bill, the church to paying the cooling bill of the church, to no removal, they're paying for uh, the pensions and the, the fee for the, you know, to pay the secretary and the groundskeeper and to help pay for the religious ed program and all of these other things, the services for the poor, right? This is going to tons of good, right? That's where the money is going to versus a you know, for-profit wedding officiant who puts on a collar and uh, stole and uh, uses the money to go on cruises or to buy second home or something to that effect where it seems more like simony, right? It's for the personal benefit of the clergy, not for the good of the church, right? Or for the good of the poor. Um, and if the only thing they do as clergy is to do weddings or something that's for profit, then that's even more scandalous. Not properly administering in any way uh, other than in a for-profit way. <laughs> Um, money thing for things annexed to the spiritual. Now, this some of this is more outdated in terms of how, particularly as Americans, it was some of this is a system we never quite had. Um, you know, we never had uh, benefices and um, canonries that were funded by a benefice or uh, old, this old money from old royalty. Uh, nobility that kind of funded certain roles of prayer. In the United States, we never we, we never quite had that. Um, so Pope Pascal, the first he points out, uh, wherefore let no person sell a church or a prebend or anything ecclesiastical. Or a prebend is an office held by a canon. So the canons were in a, a collegial church praying um, the office. And if you had a position as a canon within that collegial church, you would get paid. So maybe the, the church had owned big fields that they were being farmed out. So the farm made money. Now the money from that farm would then fund things for the poor. It would help out the bigger church. Uh, and it might also provide an income for the canons, right? They might get their own canon from their, their pre-bend uh, from their seat um, of praying. Uh, but you're, it wasn't free money. The goal was this was to pay for these prayers. So if somebody had given money uh, to the canonry to say masses for them for the next 20 years, right, after they died uh, to prepare their soul goes to heaven, uh, you know, they, they gave money on behalf of their family for these continued prayers. Uh, you can't sell that seat um, to somebody, uh, just because, you know, this is kind of something that happened after the Protestant Reformation, where sometimes Protestants would get these anonary seats in Europe, and you know, were they still praying the office? Were they offering masses for these people? Well, no, they weren't even Catholic. They weren't offering masses. Um, were, were they even praying the office? Maybe not, right? They were just taking the money, and they weren't doing the work. They, uh, Go to the main cathedral in Utrecht in the Netherlands. There was a tomb of a, a wealthy person, and uh, right on the tomb is the, the words written on it. You know, they had paid for masses said for their soul for the next five hundred years or something like that. They prepaid the next five hundred years with the masses and all this. And then a few years later, the Protestant Reformation comes, and uh, the Protestants take all the money of the church. Well, that person never had the 500 years of masses said for them. In some sense, the pre-bend was uh, taken, right? Uh, this, the money for that seat was 
taken for them. Uh, that would be uh, that would be simony, right? The, the, the Protestants who did that that was simony. Um, now uh, the church also shouldn't voluntarily sell those seats. Uh, they should, you know, they were given for spiritual purposes. They should be given to people who are going to do spiritual work. Uh, a spiritual thing uh, is, is dependent on something spiritual, therefore it can't be sold. Right? Certain things are done by priests or monks uh, for the purpose of prayer. You can't sell that to a lay person um, because it's financially profitable for the church. Right? That has to stick with the, the sacred purpose. Now something like a vessel or even a church building you know, of course, Pope Pascal was really black and white. The church, uh, St. Thomas gives a little more gray. Yet certain things that are religious, uh, which have been annexed for spiritual purposes, like a chalice or a church, they could be sold um, if they needed to be, right? And, and St. Ambrose says, or, you know, you could sell a chalice, help feed the poor. Right? You know, we have plenty of chalices that's made out of gold. There's a famine. Uh, there's a plague. You need to feed the poor. If you have to sell a chalice to feed the poor, the Lord will not be mad at you for selling that chalice to feed the poor. You know, according to St. Ambrose. Um, St. Thomas says the same thing. That can be fine. But what you have to do is, you know, deconsecrate the thing, the church, the chalice, whatever it is. You've got to deconsecrate it, for one. Two, when you sell it, Selling it really for the materials, either you got to melt it down or, you know, but you're selling it for the material. There's no added um, value because it was consecrated, right? Uh, selling one pound of gold, it sells for one pound of gold. You can't say, well, this was a chalice, therefore it should be worth twice regular gold because this has holiness on it. If you're doing that, you're selling the spiritual. Right, you're not you're not supposed to do that. Um, if, if you're selling a church building, for whatever reason, right? you can't charge more for the church because the mass was offered in the church. You deconsecrated it, and now you're selling it for the sake of it being a building. Right, you're not you can't add value to it because it was somewhat sacred. Um, otherwise, that would be contrary. Right, you're making a you're making money off of it because it's sacred. Otherwise, you could make a chalice, say mass in it, sell it for more than you paid for it because, and now it's like, well, it's worth more because it's full, it was used for the full blood of Christ. That's not allowed. Uh, exchange for spiritual, the spiritual for services, right? Well, this is very straightforward, so I didn't give it much attention, but. Um, you can't, simony is selling the, the sacred. Well, you can't sell, uh, can't sell it for cash. You can't sell it for property. You can't sell it for information. You can't sell it for anything which can be turned into money. Right? Money is anything that has monetary value, uh, not just the coins, like the land, what, whatever it is. You know, money, you can't, you can't sell the sacred for anything of value, you know, regardless of money or something. Um, if you are guilty of simony or you receive something of sacred purpose or office uh, because of simony, uh, can you keep it? Uh, can you keep the office, can you keep the, the spiritual position? Well, the answer is universally, and this is a very long article, no. <laughs> no, you cannot keep it. Um, uh, one that has been ordained through simony, paying to be ordained. Uh, uh, St. Thomas doesn't say that it's not invalid. Doesn't say that. Although, you know, he says if you were to find a bishop who is, uh, has his office because of simony, you shouldn't be ordained by that bishop. Um, right? You should excommunicated from you. Nobody should communicate with this person, which ultimately means you are excommunicated. Right? You, you are, you, it's not that the ordination was necessarily invalid, it, and it seems like what St. Thomas is saying is that it's not invalid, it's just you can't, you, you, you have no faculties. You, 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 you 
can, you cannot exercise your priesthood or bishophood or anything else if you have done it through a synod, uh, and the church will sanction you uh, and lower you uh, if you will submit. Um, uh, now, if you if somebody else has paid for it and you you weren't aware of it, you know, probably something that happened more in the medieval period where you know somebody's father paid for the person get have a position in the the person who received it might not even have been aware that his father had done that um well you still can't keep the position right it's still simony you can't keep the position uh, st thomas points out that if you don't have to pay back any of the fruits you consumed while in the office uh, if you spent any money or you lived in a house you don't have to pay that back to the church if you are completely unaware of it, um, presuming you're doing the, the job you are supposed to do. So I guess that's payment for doing the job you're supposed to do. Um, but you don't have to pay it back. Now, if you were guilty of simony, you gotta pay everything back. <laughs> right? You gotta step down and you gotta pay back anything you consumed, anything you benefited, anything you have got, you have gained from it in any way, you have to pay back and you are, now in a state of really excommunication and you humble yourself before the church and the church can figure out what to do with you. Maybe they give you a position of minor orders. If you did it to get into a monastery, you know, maybe you have to reapply to the monastery, but you can you know, you lose it all. You lose it all the church is the key. Um, and you cannot reclaim the money that you spent for the simony. You know, it's kind of like that Judas type money. Nobody wants the money, but you you don't get it back. Um, uh, so in conclusion, uh, with simony, uh, it's the buying and selling of spiritual offices or things. Uh, it is only uh, it is only lawful to accept money for the sacraments to pay for uh, the needs of the church, uh, the needs of the priests, the needs of the poor. But it's it's not possible to to, to buy the grace. The grace is always free. Uh, the church is simply the mediator of that grace for Christ. Um, it is lawful to pay the clergy uh, of the church for their livelihoods, but it's not, and you can't pay more for the grace that they've offered. Uh, it's lawful to sell uh, sacred objects uh, in certain conditions, but you have to, they have to be de consecrated and, they're, and the, the fact that they were sacred objects can add no additional value to their sale. Um, otherwise you would be selling that added value, which would be the grace part. You can't be selling grace. Um, and uh, anything of value can create simony, not just money, it could be anything of value. Um, and the punishment of simony is really the loss of everything, right? the loss of the office, the loss any benefit one has gained, one is shamed, one is in uh, infamy. Um, the only thing is if you were completely unaware that somebody had bought you that office, you can, uh, you, can you don't have to pay back the fruits you gained while in that office, that, that you consumed while in that office, as Thomas said. Um, but, uh, so now we are officially done with the, the vices, the deficiencies, uh, of religion, uh, of irreligion, uh, and we are moving on uh, to piety. Wonderful.